Different than supporters of law as culture, dear fellows, co-workers, co-directors, and dear Pierre Brunet. It is a particular pleasure for me to introduce Pierre Brunet, professor at the Sorbonne, to the circle of the friends and supporters of the Kater Hamburger Kolleg, Law as Culture. This is our third conference that under normal circumstances would have taken place at the Max Weber Lecture Hall as part of the forum's evenings. Instead, we will communicate by way of a Zoom meeting in order to bring forward the currently dealt thematic of law and Gemeinschaft, asking whether the retour à la nature implies building new types of communalities, communities, beliefs in communality and corresponding legal communities. Let me start, if you allow, with some reflections about the role of nature in the understanding of modernity. Modernity has constituted itself in a multiple sense in the confrontation with nature. It is characterized precisely by a specific relationship towards nature. It is only the technological mastery of na nature that releases simple communities from the grip of the forces of nature. Only the comprehensive exhaustion of nature's resources leads to the unleashing of the economic dynamics of capitalist societies, while only the overcoming of the state of nature by an artificial, arbitrary social order removes the obstacles of traditional communities. And only the moral, cognitive, and aesthetic replacement of culture by traditional images of nature has made possible the demoralization of the sciences, entmoralisierung, nicht demoralisierung ist gemeint, entmoralisierung, the demystification of the world from magical religious ideas, and the transformation of nature into what the aesthetic discourse calls landscape. In a peculiar dialectic of the natural conditions of human existence, this ethos of world as nature domination has turned into its opposite. Man-induced climate change, the Anthropocene, and we talked about this last week with Yusra Abu Dhabi, fundamentally threatens to endanger the conditions of human existence, la condition humaine. For this reason, there is a desperate need to discuss strategies for absorbing the disaster scenario. Economic approaches to the allocation of emission rights, moral commitments of an enlightened ecological consciousness are being dis discussed, as well as the return to a communicative relationship with nature or reg regulatory and planning interventions by state authorities, the possibility of transnational climate change lawsuits, ecological reservations about state intervention in the pandemic or the coupling of economic stimulus packages for the economy with the requirements of climate change. However, the lessons to be drawn from the uh, current uh, corona crisis are not very clear. Bruno Latour is more than reluctant that the state could play such a role as the agent to save the world as he tries to play it during the uh, epidemic crisis. So there are really a lot of very fundamental questions. Pierre Brunet seems to be particularly apt to reply to the challenges linked with this complex thematic. Let me say some words about his career. Everybody knows him and we know we have read it. However, I might remind you. Pierre Brunet is professor of public 
Law at the Sorbonne Law School in University of Paris 1, Pantheon Sorbonne, where he has been teaching legal theory, philosophy of justice, comparative constitutional law since 2015. Before joining the Sorbonne Law School, he has been lecturer in Paris 2, Pantheon Assas, and then appointed as professor of public law, first in Rouen, and then in Nanterre, Université de Nanterre. This is also in, it is also in Nanterre that he had defended his PhD about the concept of representation, représentation, Representations, Dynamiken und so weiter in Deutschen, in the theory of state. Uh, theory of state, Staatslehre, allgemeine Staatslehre, as we would say in German, where there is no real equivalent, neither in France nor in the common law traditions, insofar as I see. And Michel Tropper, who was his uh, uh, supervisor, is really somebody who knows all the different ramifications of this debate uh, from the interior because he had made so many important contributions to this specific debate. I have great admir admiration for Michel Tropper. He is a former member of the Institut Universitaire de France uh, from 2009 to 2014, where I, by the way, some of you might know, I'm honored to be the honorary president of, and has been visiting in many universities in Japan, Cardozo Law School, in Essex, American University in Washington DC, and very often in Italy, in Turin, Bologna, Genova, Modena, Roma, etc. He has further been a fellow at the Max Planck Institute for International and Comparative Law, and is currently, as all of you know, fellow at our center, at the Kater Hamburger Center, Recht als Kultur. Uh, in addition, since 2017, he's heading the journal Droit et Société, Law and Society, the French main journal for the Francophonian world, one can say in general, um, as co-chief editor with uh, Laurence Dumoulin, uh, it, we must absolutely find a way to bring her to the center one day. Perhaps we should make a commission or a session of Droit et Société at our uh, house, uh, because if I remember right, he has not thrown me out. I'm still also a member of the committee. Okay, uh, so we come to his publications. Um, his recent works include Para un análisis del discurso jurídico um, a Bogotá. So this is a nice book, a beautiful one. It's in Spanish. And it's readable for those who read at least Spanish. An edited book, Forme et Doctrine de l'État, Dialogue entre Histoire du droit et Théorie du droit. Once again, theory of law, general jurisprudence, one could say in English, but all those terms are very much impregnated by the specific legal culture that does not only speak about the content of the law, but also about the way to reflect the law. There are different streams to think the law in those different legal cultures. Uh, it would be a further topic, really, to be uh, that would need reflections. But um, besides those uh, uh, very uh, fascinating uh, 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 publications, there is a, a long, uh, uh, becoming longer and longer list of writings about uh, nature. Vouloir pour la nature, la représentation juridique des entités naturelles. For example, les droits de la nature et la personnalité juridique des entités naturelles, un commun qui s'ignore, etc. So we must know the, that he's becoming more and more a specialist in this field, in the intersection of legal theory, ecological normativities, I would say, and then the application to four very political and very visible reasons that are not, uh, that cannot remain on the simple reflexive 
uh, level, uh, but, uh, uh, but it is also about um, activities. So let me just conclude this uh, short in introduction. I could have been even longer, excuse me for being a little bit long, but however, I uh, think it was needed and necessary. I would like uh, to mention the perspectives um, as uh, to this specific topic, as it can be drawn from the law as culture paradigm, which was developed and tested in the first phase of the center. I start, and as you might remember, uh, it's about six main points, and I start with the first one. Questioning and asking, is the loss of a belief in natural law, Verlust des Naturrechtsglaubens, there is common sense about that, which characterizes the legal cultures of modernity, at least, to be compensated by a natural law to nature, ein Naturrecht auf Natur. What does it mean beyond a play upon words that might be funny, but in the end, it's not about fun? Does it make sense to distinguish in this context, a symbolic, ritual, organizational, normative, and narrative dimension in this type, nature-related normativities, as I would like to call it? First block of questions I have. Second one. To what extent does a religiously shaped relationship to nature, from the Protestant ethics and the spirit of ecologism to the supposedly unistic relationship to nature of Asian societies, indigenous conceptions, Islamic ideas, as we have discussed with Yusra Abu Dhabi last week, do they interact with the respective legal cultures that react to the interventions in nature? So is there a relationship between the cultures of conceiving nature and legal cultures? Thirdly, to what extent is the globalization generated, generated by ecological interdependencies known as global risk society, also accompanied by a global legal culture. Fourth, which conflict situations does the combination of natural relations and legal culture drive into as soon as national and cultural borders are crossed and fundamental questions of ethical and legal globality can no longer be denied? Fifth, is it still possible to think of natural aesthetic demands on a beautiful landscape in the age of climate change or have art and law already reached there? And here it's about the question, you know, that we, uh, we attribute an important role to the aesthetic dimension of analyzing by analyzing from a culturalist point of view the law. And what kind of role is in the nature-related normativities uh, problematic, important, if you want to understand give, what does landscape art, for example, from Longo, and of nature art, like Janet Lawrence has proposed, tell us about the new state of nature. And finally, does it make sense, despite considerable differences in legal cultures and the different and orientations of the religiously coined nature relations to demand a global ecologically coined legal culture, which gives meaning and calls for position finding on the world in one name, in the name of nature. That would be the last question in the logic of the law as culture paradigm. Those at least are some of the questions that arise in the framework of the Lawrence culture paradigm. But we will listen now with the greatest attention to your analysis, uh, cher Pierre uh, Brunet, uh, under the title, Navigating the Right to Off Nature Turn Main Issues. Uh, dear Pierre, the Zoom, sorry, the floor, the floor is yours. It's, uh, it's uh, really a great pleasure to be there, uh, even if I'm quite alone in this institute, <laughs> you know, because I really love to, to work here. It's, it's a really great place. And 
uh, it's also um, quite a challenge for me because uh, this is the first time I, I, I try to, to map uh, the issues uh, I, I am uh, trying to, to work on uh, as I am trying to, 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 to write a book on, on this topic and uh, the the more I work and the, the, the less I know and the more I know that I need to learn a lot. So uh, I really need to, first of all, to, to, to tell you how uh, to apologize because I probably I, I'm sometimes quite confusing as I'm not exactly um, totally sure about the, 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 the hypothesis I have. Anyway, as Werner uh, kindly reminded, uh, I, I worked a little bit on, on this topic. It's, uh, it's something which is uh, uh, in my, uh, I'm concerned with that. Um, I've been concerning uh, since three years, about three years, and I, I try to not to be uh, an environmental lawyer uh, from the technical point of view. That it's not my point, uh, and that's the main one of the main issue I have. It's that I try to to give a, a look at that from the legal theory and social theory. And as I worked a lot on the question of representation, I I have uh, a, 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 it's a, it's a sort of a, a bias, but I I think that one of the main issue, which is not exactly in the uh, outline uh, I sent you, but which is uh, uh, implicit in, in all the um, all the points, is the main issue is uh, uh, the question of representation of nature, uh, which is uh, uh, from the mental point of view, but also from the legal point of view, the sociological point of view, and and anthropological point of view. So there are many many um, uh, aspects of the, the problem. So the outline I gave you uh, was uh, in order to, to, to identify uh, what are the main points uh, I think uh, we, we uh, well, I think we have to take into account. And I will start with uh, the first question, which is about I, I probably I won't give uh, a clue for any or for all the uh, the points, but. One of the main points we have to, to, to face is the, the, the question of the, uh, the ontology um, and the legal ontology uh, we, we, are, uh, we have. As you know, one of the, the starting points is uh, the, the work of anthropologists. And uh, we have to mention here at least uh, Escobar and Descola, but we could also uh, mention uh, Richthofen. Many anthropologists have work on these uh, on the, the classic Western dualism, and they have discussed this dualism between man and nature, not in order to uh, to to say that uh, other cultures do not have that kind of dualism, but to to mention how the dualism is much more complex. Uh, and one of the the, the points made by Escobar and Escola is that. In many cultures, um, the relations between man and nature is um, uh, is not univoc or univocal, uh, uh, but we have quite um, many different uh, kinds of relationships. And I, I don't know if uh, I can uh, go deep in the in the, the, the category uh, or the typology of the scholar, but as you know, he distinguished between between the naturalism, the uh, analogism, uh, the uh, totemism, and uh, the animism. I, I won't discuss this typology, but this typology uh, uh, play the, the, is playing between the physicality and the interiority. And the idea is that we do have the, the invariant in all cultures are uh, the um, there are two invariants, which is the, the the representation of physicality and interiority, and these um, these two notions are uh, 
are uh, varying and, and, and diverse, depending on the culture. And one point which is uh, currently made by some lawyers is that we are facing through many uh, decisions, judicial decisions, but also rules and provisions, we are facing a sort of a new animism, of a neo-animism, uh, which is not exactly uh, the animism from the indigenous peoples, for example, but we are recreating in the Western world and through many uh, uh, provisions and, and judicial decisions, we are recreating a sort of an animism. And of course, one of the most um, surprising and, and fantastic example of that uh, could be uh, the way we have uh, from, from at least 10 years, we are facing uh, a renewal of the idea of uh, rights of nature. This topic, rights of nature, is in fact, is not that new. In the 70s, um, we had many, many uh, uh, papers uh, on the topic, and one of the most famous papers was uh, the, 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 the article from uh, Christopher Stone, as you probably heard about, uh, which was, uh, the title was, uh, Should Trees Have Standing? Uh, I, I won't uh, come back to that in, in the details, but as you know, uh, Christopher Stone was uh, at the University of Southern California and he was um, implied or involved in uh, defense of uh, uh, forests uh, on which uh, Walt Disney and, uh, the, the, and firms wanted to transform this forest uh, in, a, in, a, in a ski um, uh, area. And so he, he had this idea to... He, the imagination, uh, as he, he, he gave this anecdote, uh, he was in class and he had the idea that what, what would be, what if trees could stand? And, uh, and from that, he, he gave this beautiful paper, which is very interesting, at least at, with, from two points of view. First of all, it's a technical article, it's not, um, a philosophy of law article, and, uh, and, and Stone defends uh, a, a very positivistic point of view. Uh, he doesn't call for a new natural right or new natural law, sorry, but uh, he, he, he really is reasoning as a, as, a, as a legal scholar from his own categories. And this paper, as you know, uh, has been quoted by William Douglas uh, uh, during this case, uh, the, the case Walt Disney and and uh, and the forest uh, in in the um, in the Supreme Court. And uh, from this, uh, the paper has been uh, very read. But of course, in fact, uh, there was no big discussion about that and uh, Stone continued to work on that. And the topic came back from international law, but also from uh, other uh, individuals like uh, uh, Godofredo Stutzin, uh, who made uh, uh, some articles. He was professor in, Ch in Chile, and he, he didn't know first uh, Christopher Stone, but then made also papers on the, on the question of giving rights to nature and giving the legal personality to all. And this point uh, also encountered the, 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 the philosophical uh, and anthropological uh, reflection uh, and, uh, and the contestation also of the Western uh, way of development. And here we are facing the, the, the great uh, ontological point of view because in the same years, uh, the, the, the question of rights of animals has been, uh, uh, became a, a very great uh, discussion. And so the, the, the main point was how to give a sort of intrinsic value and to recognize the intrinsic value of nature on animals or, or the living 
things, but how can we think these living things not as things, but as something else? Uh, and the debate uh, has been profoundly, deeply renewed uh, in the in the end uh, of uh, of the uh, in the beginning of the the, the, the two thousand years, uh, especially in Ecuador uh, through the the new constitution in Ecuador in two thousand eight, and later in Bolivia through uh, also a, um, a, a statute uh, enacted in two thousand ten. These two countries recognize the Pachamama and so uh, the, the, the Ecuador uh, Constitution in Chapter 7 included rights for nature. And uh, these provisions uh, have also been um, applied to the courts. Uh, in 2011, for example, the, the, the provincial court of uh, in Ecuador uh, granted an, uh, an injunction um, based on the constitutional provision uh, on the application of uh, two individuals, American citizens, in fact. And the court um, halted um, a project to, to, to widen the road that led to the deposition of large um, quantities of rock and uh, materials in the river. And the judges uh, considered uh, it's necessary to, to apply um, the, the, what we call the precautionary principle uh, to give practical uh, effect uh, to the rights of nature. And uh, they, the, the main point of the decision is that they, they reversed the, the, the burden of, of proof requiring the, uh, the, the the, the public uh, authority, uh, the, the, the province, the govern, provincial uh, government, uh, to show that the project would not damage the river. And later, the, the other uh, case I have to, to, to mention, there are three cases I want to mention, and I'm sorry for all this uh, background. One of the most um, impressive cases, uh, which has uh, been uh, worldly uh, recognized was uh, the enactment uh, from the uh, New Zealand Parliament in 2017, 2017 in March 2017, uh, the, the, uh, the, the end of negotiations between the government of New Zealand and the Maori, uh, the Maori tribe, um, and the uh, negotiations uh, resulted in an agreement that recognized the rights of the um, of the river Vanganui, um, the rights of the tribe's uh, spiritual ancestor, uh, which was uh, which is the, the river Vanganui. And uh, in the 20th of March uh, 2017, uh, the, the, this agreement has been um, adopted and acted as a legislation from the parliament. And then the result of this uh, act uh, is that the, the, um, uh, the river uh, is recognized and acknowledged as a legal person through uh, uh, the new uh, legal person uh, with a, a, a Maori name, uh, Te Putupua, and uh, the model uh, from that is the model of a guardianship. Uh, the, the, the guardian um, is uh, represented uh, through uh, both uh, people from the tribe and people from the government. And this model, uh, and the model from the agreement, in fact, gave an idea and the clue uh, to the uh, Colombian Constitutional Court, uh, which recognized also, uh, which granted uh, another river, the, the river Atrato in Colombia, uh, granted legal personhood to uh, this river. And uh, the case had been um, lodged by uh, an NGO, um, focused on, on illegal mining activities along the river. 
and uh, basing itself on provisions of the Constitution, but the Constitution, the Colombian Constitution, do not recognize in itself rights of nature. But the court uh, used uh, its own jurisprudence uh, and, and decisions in order to mention that there was uh, from 1991, uh, an ecological constitution uh, through many provisions from the Colombian constitution. And they, at the end of the day, uh, acknowledged and granted the personhood to the river, also in order to designate guardians and the local communities uh, uh, and the complex, it's quite complex uh, uh, in, in Colombia, in this country, in, uh, in the in the Choco, which is uh, with three different uh, categories of people, uh, and they, they, they create uh, guardians. And nowadays, right now, uh, the, the, the people from this river are uh, participating in, uh, in decisions for the river. And the last case, I'm sorry, I'm too long, uh, it's about the Gange and the Yamuna River in India. And in this case, it's not a parliament, it's not the constitutional court, but it's judges, only two judges from the High Court of Uttarakhand who decided to grant the Gange and the Yamuna River the legal personhood as living entities with legal rights. And it was just a few days after uh, the, 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 the announcement of the uh, enactment uh, on the from the New Zealand uh, Parliament, because this, the first decision is on 20 of March, uh, and the announcement was the 15 of March. And 10 days later, the same judges in the same court uh, granted the glacier of the rivers uh, legal personhood and all the ecosystem of the uh, 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 rivers. And so all these cases and all the background I have recalled, I'm sorry to be too long, makes that we are facing a sort of a big trend because these three cases, in fact, are not uh, unique. Uh, uh, right now, you have at least 10, uh, more than 10 decisions in Colombia granting rivers uh, legal personhood, but it's not only in, in Colombia. Uh, we have also the case of Lac Herrier in the United States, uh, with which uh, a, a referendum has been organized in order to grant uh, the, the, the lake uh, the legal personhood. You have the Bangladesh, to also recognize uh, the, the legal personhood of rivers. And then we are talking about a transnational model of guardianship of uh, natural entities. But the main problem is one of the legal, of the, of the theoretical problem and ontological problem is that can we really think uh, or can we really talk about animism? I, I, I'm not going to give a, a definite answer of that, but this is uh, an answer which is, uh, or this is a question which is to me uh, uh, quite important because. Uh, we, we also have a, a, a very um, a legal question behind this, which is how do we represent ourselves, uh, the law, and how we, in fact, facing uh, legal Western constructions, uh, trying to incorporate some uh, indigenous or local uh, beliefs, or are we really facing a sort of a transformation of uh, Western categories uh, in local and indigenous uh, beliefs? From my point of view, uh, working on, on, the, the, on, on this topic, uh, my hypothesis is that the, the, the hypothesis of animism is uh, in fact a little bit too strong and uh, the, the, the one of the arguments I, I could have, which is, is that from the indigenous people, for example, and, and for the, from the Maori um, uh, legal scholars uh, or legal thinker, uh, in fact, the, the construction, uh, the New Zealand uh, construction is not, uh, is an adaptation, but it's not the real translation 
of the, the uh, Maori beliefs. Uh, and I, I, I could uh, go deep, deeper in these uh, beliefs, but uh, it would be too long. But, but the fact is that, uh, for example, uh, as Vernon know that better than I, because I read his paper on, on the two natures, uh, the awa uh, for the, the, um, the uh, Maori, uh, like a river, or, uh, uh, is not an individual, uh, but it's a, a, a living community. Which uh, unified the fish, the plants, the, the people, the ancestors, and the water, and all that is um, all this world makes a sort of a community and unity. While in, um, in the in the in the in the Act, the New Zealand Act, uh, we have provisions recognizing uh, the unity of the river, but you have some provisions on the property. Uh, on the water who do not um, recognize exactly the same belief. So we have a real hybridation, uh, a construction, an artifact. Uh, and, and the artifact is in the Western categories and we do not change, in fact, the real, uh, the real point of view and the, and the ontology. We are using, we are, I mean, they are, in, in the system, they are using ontologies or category, uh, ontological categories in order to make something which is, in fact, a sort, a sort of a political compromise. And this kind of political compromise can be also seen um, in, in other uh, cases, like the Colombian and the Indian. And so, um, if, we, uh, if we have this, uh, this dimension, we also need uh, to take in account uh, all these anthropological uh, background. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I see that I'm quite too long. I, I will make just one point about the, the legal reasoning and the use of uh, rights of nature in legal reasoning uh, from the, the, the Indian and, and Colombian judges, for example. For the, the Colombian and the Indian cases, uh, I, I will just uh, try to focus on the, on the legal reasoning. Uh, the, the, in fact, the, 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 the two courts, if I could say that, uh, had um, they had they had two strategy uh, very different strategy from the from the legal argumentation and, and that's quite interesting um, uh, because the, the as I said uh, first the Colombia judges tried to show that it was implicit in the constitutional text uh, in the constitutional provisions uh, there was there was a, a recognition of uh, rights for nature or rights to nature uh, implicit. And so they, they, uh, they, they mentioned many, many of their own decisions in order to create uh, this uh, system, uh, this ecological constitution. And more than this, they used another argument which is very original uh, and that I touch in another point, uh, the argument of the biocultural rights which is a proposal from an uh, Anglo-Indian uh, legal scholar, Babikate, uh, and the idea of biocultural rights is the idea that some local communities, in fact, have rights protecting both uh, the, uh, the cultural diversity, but also the biological diversity of their own middle, uh, and so, from this idea to cover both the bioelements and, and the, the, the uh, uh, cultural elements, we can think uh, of a protection of the, the, the way of life. And this way of life is intrinsically linked to uh, the environment, the, 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 the territory of this local community. And so, local communities, sorry. And so the Colombian court used this proposal, which was, uh, which is in fact uh, not uh, a positive law uh, or the legata thing, argument, but they, they, they mentioned in as if other international provisions had recognized uh, these uh, um, biocultural rights. And the other strategy from the Indian judges was uh, at 
are the opposite to uh, mention that besides uh, the constitutional duty to protect the environment, which is uh, absolutely positive in the constitution, uh, the Indian constitution, through the uh, two uh, provisions the, uh, um, in the Indian constitution from 1976. And so they decided, also they mentioned the fact that more than a constitutional duty, there is a moral duty for everyone in the world to protect the environment. And so they strengthened the, the, the constitutional provisions through a, a, a purely moral uh, reasoning and, uh, and, and they also uh, linked their own moral reasoning in the Hindu uh, beliefs uh, in the, uh, the, the Hindu beliefs that uh, recognizing that uh, the Gange and Yamuna, for example, are a sacred uh, um, uh, elements. And so, what can we uh, learn from all these cases and all these argumentation and, and discussion? Uh, one of the main problems, as I said in the first, in the beginning, is the main question is. Who is talking for nature? Who is speaking for nature? Shall we uh, consider that there is a, a purely transnational model in, uh, 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 without mentioning that the, 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 it's not the same when the parliament or the constitutional court or the judges, uh, the local judges, are, are, are speaking for nature? Shall we consider that only NGOs or public officers should speak for nature? What, what, what would be the, the best model? Of course, I don't have the answer for that. But the main discussion is, is here. The question is, how do we legally represent uh, the, the, the nature? Uh, shall we uh, uh, imagine uh, uh, a sort of an universal ombudsman for nature, which is a point that some are making, uh, especially for uh, what we call the global commons, like atmosphere or the oceans, um, or shall we uh, consider that in fact we we need to uh, have both the local ombudsman for nature and uh, a universal ombudsman? What do we make? How do we uh, how do we make to to justify the still the sovereignty of states? Uh, if we have universal ombudsman for uh, natural elements, how can we, how can we, uh, uh, yeah, uh, answer or uh, ask the, 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 the one of the main problem, uh, main issue, which is uh, the political problem? Thank you very much, and I think uh, 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 there is no reason uh, to apologize. Um, for nature, if nature is so complex and so difficult, and to make a relationship to those who could be legal bearers or the ombudsman or whatever to speak for, in German, one would even speak in the German tradition, legal tradition of Fürsprecher, uh, etc., of uh, those entities uh, that we have, where we have difficulties to qualify them according to our. Um, the legal concepts and a theoretical concept that we have, at least in the law of modernity. However, let me uh, remind us, all of us, that in uh, penal law, for example, there had never been a question that uh, animals can be responsible and they were punished, though they were not uh, seen as bearers in the same sense of rights, but they were they, they, they were the object of punishment. The same is true of trees, of everything. So I would say, if I understand right, one could construct a point of animistic positivism, so to say, where whenever any kind of object is declared to be a legitimate bearer of a right within a constitutional procedural framework, etc., etc., one as a legal theorist of this uh, orientation would have no problem to say, yes, okay, it is endowed with right and we will 
try to find the best solution. We have to find representation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The other question, and you you were touching both of them in, in a very uh, very very uh, deep way, uh, is of course if there is something inherent uh, into those entities that claim for rights and that all that there is only a declaration act of the constitution of legal observers, uh, etc., to say yes, they have rights and we accept that they have rights. So in between those two positions, I think uh, a lot of debate uh, seems to play. That's only an observation. Uh, you made it much more clear what we talk about. And thank you very much for this very, really wonderful presentation. See you next time in our forum, Law as Culture, under what kind of uh, media uh, 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 implications, whatever, perhaps as a Zoom meeting, perhaps in reality, uh, in personal exchange, we'll see that. So thank you very much.